uh, Dr. Heman, please start. So, in, uh, introduction, uh, uh, you will give or I will have to say? Uh, it, it, you please start. You will give the introduction and then the overview of the two lectures. Uh, so basically, uh, so self introduction, right? It is. Hello. And then you can start with the overview of the two lectures. So basically, we are going to discuss on pulmonary embolism and. Uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, right? I am Dr. Rahman Bakshi. I am an interventional cardiologist, director at Sims Hospital, Ahmedabad. And uh, I have uh, done my uh, graduation, post graduation, and doctorate in medicine in uh, uh, Civil Hospital, Ahmedabad. And uh, I have experience of uh, 22 years uh, in cardiology. And I am. I have also received a fellowship of. Uh, ACC as well as European Society of Cardiology. Okay. And uh, we will have two lectures, I suppose. Uh, one is on uh, pulmonary embolism and the second one is on PCSK9 inhibitors. So we straight away start with the first lecture. It is a pre recorded one. And it is the management of acute uh, pulmonary embolism it is i think it's a case based approach so basically so, uh, this discussion but before we discuss the case i would like to highlight uh, some important points for uh, diagnosis of pulmonary embolism it is very important important to suspect that patient may be having pulmonary embolism because many a times because we don't suspect we all together make the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And for that, you should be aware of the <coughs> predisposing risk factors. And these are the strong risk factors having odd ratio of more than 10. And all of us are aware of this, that patients with fracture of lower limb, hip or knee replacement, patients with major trauma, patients with spinal cord injury, they are <coughs> strong risk factors for pulmonary embolism. And there are some new additions like hospitalization for heart failure, for atrial fibrillation and flutter within previous three months, MI within previous three months, and patients with trauma embolism. And these are the long list of moderate risk factors, having risk, I mean, odds ratio of between two to nine. And if you have any of this risk factor in your patient and patient presents to you with breathlessness, you should suspect pulmonary embolism. Now coming to the diagnostic algorithms, symptomatic patients are assessed using clinical predictions rule. And this is the well score, which is commonly used for pulmonary embolism, which assigns low, moderate or high probability of having DVT or pulmonary embolism. It can be used in primary care. And uh, this is the, these are the linear clinical variables and the scores given to them. And if the patient has score more than six, then patient is going to have high probability of pulmonary embolism. And the similar second <coughs> scoring system is this revised Virginia score. Uh, and uh, these are the factors that are taken into consideration. And, the, and, in the, and in this system, if the score is more than 11, then patient is going to have high probability of pulmonary embolism. And uh, you don't have to remember all these things because now with the availability of the smartphones and mobile applications, you can have it in your mobile. And when, whenever you find that patient may be having pulmonary embolism, you can use that, right? Now, coming to the <coughs> algorithms that patients with suspected PV, uh, pulmonary embolism, present with shock or hypotension. So, straight away, if CT angiography is available, now first test to be done is CT angiogram. You confirm the diagnosis and start PE specific treatment, that is primary reperfusion. Suppose CT angiography is not available, then the alternative is you do echocardiogram. If you find that RV is dilated, there is RV overload, then uh, you, uh, and, and patient is stabilized, now CT angiography is available, you get it done, confirm and treat the patient and if for some reason no other tests are available or patient is unstable and you are finding that there is a clot in RA or in pulmonary artery then you are justifiable in doing thrombolysis so patients with 
PE with shock or hypotension, this is the uh, algorithm. And second subset of patients are suspected PE without shock or hypotension. So here you have time. So you assess the clinical probability of the pulmonary embolism using this scoring system. If there is a low or intermediate clinical probability, probability or PE is unlikely, then D-dimer test. If D-dimer test has a good negative predictive value, so if the test is negative, then PE is virtually ruled out. But if the D-dimer test is positive, you need to confirm pulmonary embolism by doing CT angiography. And if it is confirmed, you start the treatment. If the patient is having high clinical probability of, uh, because of this high uh, well score or uh, this Geneva score, then what you do is you straight away do CT angiography, no need to do D-dimer test and confirm the diagnosis. So D-dimer test is useful in low or intermediate risk for pulmonary embolism patients and it is it has got more value if it is negative now once pulmonary embolism is diagnosed you have to risk stratify it you have to prognosify it and for that you have this clinical method that is PESI or simplified PESI score and here these are the parameters that clinical parameters that are taken into account like patients pulse rate respiratory rate temperature mental status oxygen saturation and score is given to that and if you find higher score, then patient is high risk. And it is aided by this imaging and laboratory test. That is echocardiography, CT angiography, where we look for RV dilatation, RV dysfunction. And then these are the biomarkers, BNP, anti-pro BNP, troponin, and FABP. Out of this, you can see that anti-pro BNP and troponin, they are good biomarkers as far as the prognostication of pulmonary embolism is concerned because it has got the highest hazard ratio as far as the predicting mortality in acute PE is concerned. So now coming to the algorithm, suspected P, shock hypotension, then we go to this algorithm that we already discussed, right? If patient is not having shock or hypotension, then we go to this algorithm and diagnose pulmonary embolism. Once it is diagnosed, then you assess the clinical risk by PC or simplified PC. If patient is low risk, that is PC class 1, 2 or simplified PC 0, then patient is low risk. So you can consider early discharge treatment. If patient is classic, PC class 3, 4 or simplified PC more than 1, then patient is intermediate risk. Then you consider further risk evaluation. So you send patient for echocardiography or CT, CT, CT scan. And as function and laboratory testing that is cardiac biomarkers anti pro bnp and troponin if both are positive that is rv is also dilated and biomarker are also positive then you go the patient is intermediate high risk and these patients need hospitalization anticoagulation close monitoring and you have to consider rescue repercussions thrombolysis but if one is positive or both negative that that, that means that only ECO is showing RV uh, dilatation, uh, cardiac biomarker is negative or vice versa. Then patient is intermediate low risk and what is needed is hospitalization and anticoagulation and patient is intermediate low risk. Is that clear? This is how pulmonary embolism is managed, right? Now our patient, 63-year-old uh, man, hypertension, obese, non-diabetic, no obese, no IH. Post-operative 28th day of fracture neck fever. Presented with chest heaviness and shortness of breath. On examination, looks little restless. Leg swelling is there. Blood pressure is normal. So patient is not in shock. Pulse is high, 116. Respiratory rate 21 SpO2 on 21 SpO2 on room air is 90%. Lungs are clear. CVS CNS is okay. So based on this data, if you calculate simplified PACE score, it is two because pulse rate is more than 100 and uh, saturation is 90%. Right? Now, uh, if we apply this Wells score in this patient. It is very obvious that well score is very high because everything is positive. Signs and symptoms of DVT, alternative diagnosis less likely, heart rate is more than 100, immobilization more than three days, surgery within four weeks. So well score is nine. So patient is high clinical probability from this uh, chart, right? So what will you do now? We do CT 
angiography straight away because patient is having no need to go for d dimer okay so but in uh, our hospital we have this uh, echo machine stationed in er only so uh, it, it doesn't take time we don't have to call the technician so what we do did was we put the echo probe before uh, uh, shifting the patient to radiology department we put the echo probe and echo probe confirmed that patient is having dilated rarv moderate tr rvsp was 50 and lv size was normal with normal lv function and this was confirmed by ct angiogram which showed thrombus in pa and there was a severe dilatation of the rv and rv lv ratio was more than one meanwhile blood investigations were sent troponin t was 0.7 anti pro bnp was 1500 so both positive so where does this patient uh, fall as per this uh, chart you can see that patient is intermediate risk basic class then patient is having rv dilatation plus cardiac biomarker that means patient is intermediate high risk and patient has to admitted anticoagulated and you should monitor and consider rescue reperfusion okay uh, I mean, as far as the thrombolysis in this kind of intermediate uh, risk patient is concerned, uh, the, the, the data is negative. This is the PITHO trial, which showed that although death or hemocompensation was less in the thrombolysis patient, but there were extra, I mean, ex, I mean, bleeding was very, very high. The study was negative. So what they have tried was, they tried safe dose TPA versus heparin in, in this MOPED trial. And the, uh, that showed that this safe dose TPA was more effective than heparin with no bleeding and this paper was published in chest journal which showed that half dose tpa that is 50 milligram was as effective in this intermediate risk patient and there were less bleeding other option will be this ultrasound assisted catheter direct thrombolysis but as of now it is not available in india and this is the seattle 2 study which showed that 25 percent of the tpa of this ultrasound assisted uh, thrombolysis was effective and there was no ICH and other option will be fragmentation embolectomy and catheter thrombolysis so in intermediate high risk patient the policy should be observe and act and it is the guideline is very clear that routine use of systemic thrombolysis is not recommended in, in this kind of patient close monitoring and early detection of decompensation then thrombolysis it thrombolytic therapy should be considered for intermediate high risk patient with clinical signs of decompensation and briefly one slide for uh, profile axis for profile axis in pulmonary embolism uh, if the patient has got reversible risk factor then oral anticoagulation for three months unprovoked you can give it for a longer period of time if patient has anticoagulation treatment of indefinite duration is advocated if patient has a second episode of unprovoked pulmonary embolism and the preferred agent is NOAC for obvious reasons okay now our patient intermediate risk p large thrombus what we did what did we do we gave half dose tpa 50 milligram then followed by ultra i mean uh, 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 bolus iv infusion till 24 hours post tpa started improving within few hours no bleed Echo was showed improvement after 10 to 4 hours. TPA started. Uh, the, the, um, he started Rivaroxaban 150 milligram PD is the dose. Discharge day four after three weeks. Rivaroxaban 120 milligram per day was given for three months, and then we monitored patients for bleeding and DVT. We will be discussing uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, CV disease are leading cause of death in the world and they are the top leading cause of premature uh, death globally and lipids are one of the most critical modifiable CV risk factor for acute MI. As you can see in this slide the risk effect of LDL cholesterol is cumulative over time and absolute reduction in LDL cholesterol level is the primary predictor of the relative risk reduction and uh, every 40 milligram percent decrease in LDL cholesterol decreases relative risk for CV events by 20 to 25 percent. But raised LDL, that is more than the targeted 70 milligram percent is observed in up to 70 percent of the CAD patients in India as per the clarified registry. 
and we already know that several state in studies have demonstrated there is a quantitative linear relationship between ldl cholesterol level and cv events rate <coughs> so this keeping this in background we will discuss 2019 esc guideline recommendations for lipids so what they have done is they have made more stringent criteria for ldl control and they have identified a very high risk category group of patients where the ldl cholesterol target will be 55 mg percent plus more than 55% reduction of the baseline ldl cholesterol as against in 2016 they had said that the target should be less than 70 or more than 50% reduction in ldl cholesterol and which are the, these very high risk patients they have identified patients with documented acvd patients with multi vessel disease diabetes mellitus patients with target organ damage patients with severe ckd all these patients were categorized into very high risk category where ldl cholesterol goal should be less than 55 mg percent and to to achieve this target now they have recommended that for secondary prevention in patients who are already receiving statin and azetamib and targets are not met you can add a combination of pcsk9 inhibitor with drugs and it is now a class 1 indication for uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome again if ldl cholesterol goal is not achieved within 4 to 6 weeks with maximum statin and azetamib pcsk9 is recommended it is class 1 indication and for the first time they have added that the addition of pcsk9 inhibitor maybe as early as during hospitalization uh, should be considered if the targets targets are not met despite the maximum treatment and what they have again stressed is that that acvd patient who have second vascular event within 2 years while taking maximum maximum tolerated statin dose based therapy ldl cholesterol goal should be less than 40 mg percent so they have become very aggressive as far as the ldl control is concerned so the highlights of this esc dyslipidemia guidelines are more intensive ldl cholesterol reduction across all cv categories pcsk9 moved from class 2b to class 1a no lower limit for ldl cholesterol value remember lower is better so don't my dear friends don't go on uh, i mean uh, following whatsapp in your city or facebook in your cities the sign says no lower limit for ldl cholesterol uh, values for high risk patient and very high risk population has been clearly defined and they should be having ldl cholesterol of with 50% ldl cholesterol reduction in in uh, from the baseline for recurrent recurrent events ldl cholesterol less than 40 mg percent and acs patient you have to evaluate at 4 to 6 weeks and if goals are not met pcsk9 inhibitor should be added and first ever recommendation for acs patient to consider pcsk9 inhibition as early as in hospital in patients who are taking maximum lipid lowering therapy and not achieving ldl cholesterol goal so <clears throat> pcsk9 as you all know is a regulator of ldl metabolism it, de it degrades uh, ldl receptor and uh, uh, the, the number of ldl receptor goes down and ldl level goes up so pcsk9 inhibitor acts on that and that's why ldl cholesterol in the circulation goes down by increasing the ldl cholesterol uh, ldl receptor now <clears throat> the dose of pcsk9 is 140 mg every 2 weeks or 420 mg once monthly efficacy it is proven approximate reduction of 50 to 60% with this treatment across the treatment combination therapy monotherapy in heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and in statin intolerant patients uh it consistently reduces pro atherogenic lipid parameters like apob lipoprotein small a and vldl and increases hdl the uh, uh the trial have shown that there is a linear relationship i mean the lower the ldl cholesterol less the event rate up to 20 mg percent of the ldl cholesterol there were significant uh, event reduction and this was the study four year trial 27000 patients who were a uh, high risk stable patient with established cv disease with prior mi stroke or symptomatic pad with ldl cholesterol of more than 70 and non hdl more than 100 where they were randomized to this evolucumab versus placebo and the study showed this ldl cholesterol was reduced by 59% decrease in cv outcome in patients already on statin therapy and it was safe 
and well tolerated. And as we discussed, there is incremental benefit with the LDL reduction in primary endpoints. The higher risk reduction in patients who had MI less than two years, those patients who had more than two prior MIs, and patients with multivessel disease. As far as the safety is concerned, no safety concerns, even with LDL cholesterol of less than 20 milligram percent. And you should adopt highest risk, highest benefit strategy, strategy that is highest risk patients, those with highest baseline event rate, or patients who have highest starting LDL cholesterol will achieve the greatest absolute reduction in LDL cholesterol and, and hence the greatest risk reduction on the drugs. And which are these highest risk category patients? Patients with clinical ACVD with diabetes with or without CKD, patients with clinical ACVD with CKD, patients with recent ACS in less than three months, CHD and poorly controlled risk factors, CHD and peripheral vascular disease, CHD and age more than 65 years, stroke, TIA and male, and CHD and familiar hypercholesterolemia. All these patients have more than 30 percent. 10 year risk and they are the highest risk categories and these patients are going to benefit with this aggressive treatment with PCSK9. So now we will discuss some case 46 year old male clinical history known case of IHD hypertension diabetes and dyslipidemia multiple risk factor 2013 first MI with 19 percent eccentric RCA lesion. 2017 second MI with 80% culprit reason in RCA, 2019 STEMI, CAG, LAD 70% proximal, lipid profile, HDL 38, LDL 87, medication statin 40. Will this patient benefit from further lowering of HDL cholesterol? As we discussed already, patient has got recurrent MI, multiple severity factor, patient is on statin, LDL 87, recommended LV, LDL level in, in this patient as per the ESC is 40 milligram percent because patient is having <coughs> multiple uh, as, as we see multiple events plus multiple risk factors. So evolucum with definitely provide benefit in these patients. As you can see the uh, I mean uh, the slide we already showed that up to 20 milligram per percent there is event reduction plus patient has higher risk reduction when patient has got more than two prior MI. Second case is 57 year old patient, known case of hypertension, dyslipidemia, progressive diffuse atherosclerotic disease pattern, angiogram shows multiple lesions in RCA, LMC, LAD, patient presented with chest pain, diagnosed with acute coronary syndrome, current medication state in 80 milligram and ARB. So points to consider, multivessel disease on high intensity state in multiple risk factors, presented with event, the, the PCSK9 will surely provide benefit along with statin to achieve the targeted level. And as we discussed, higher risk reduction in multi-vessel disease. So these kind of patients should be put on PCSK9 inhibitors. Third case is 52 year old male admitted in ICU seven, some, some, seven months ago with chest pain, diagnosed with ACS, 90% lesion in RCA is found, PCI is done, statin 80 milligram continued for two months. LDL still at 100 milligram percent while on statin treatment. In the first follow up, LDL 104 milligram percent, statin 80 milligram. So points to consider, recent MI, seven months ago, already on high intensity statin, still HDL 100, 104, recommended LDL as per ESC 55. So definitely PCSK9 is going to help, higher reduction in MI less than two years. So these kind of patients should be uh, considered for treatment over and above statin and azetimibe with PCSK9 treatment. So lastly, for whom patients with high risk PCSK9, high risk patient, recurrent MI, prior event within two years, more than one prior event, multivessel disease, ACS patient, including in patients, if not at targeted LDL goals, even after taking maximum tolerated dose of lipid lowering treatment, familial hypercholesteremia, and of course statin intolerance. Thank you. Yes, so I think uh, we are done with the two lectures and we can take the questions if at all they are there. Hello.
सो एम आई ऑडिबल हेलो You can start, doctor. Hello. Hello, doctor. We can start with the questions. So, are there any questions? In the private chat, we can see them. Yes. Yes, doctor. We have questions. In the private chat, we can see that. Where is that private chat? On your right side. Yeah. So, what are the specific monitoring parameters in cardiac patients on PCS in any meters? Are the potential contraindications? Yeah. Which critical presentation thrombolytics indicated? So first, we will take that question, right? At which clinical presentations in pulmonary embolism thrombolytics are indicated? As was clearly shown in the slide, if there is a large PE with a hemodynamic compromise, then it is a it is an indication for thrombolysis. And uh, other indication of thrombolysis is in intermediate high risk group of patients, uh, where. Uh, uh, Initially, uh, patients are managed with anticoagulants, but uh, if there is a signs of clinical decompensation, then they recommend half dose thrombolytic. That is, 50 milligram of TPA should be given. Okay. As far as the uh, ECSK9 inhibitors are concerned. I mean, they are relatively safe drugs and uh, they can be given uh, patients safely. And uh, potential contraindications, uh, I mean, only potential absolute contraindications will be hypersensitivity to the PCCs and inhibitors, nothing else. Any other question? Do we, have, do we have any other question or we hello doctor we can conclude Hello. 
some problem with the network uh dr hemang we do not have yeah. any further questions so you can please conclude now yeah so thank you very much uh, doc plexus and uh, the participants for this uh, webinar uh, looking forward to see you in near future thank you thank you dr hemang